I see it as a film. Instead of going on a truck to a theater, it goes on a truck to the TV. <laughs> Welcome to Twin Peaks Rewatch. From Idle Thumbs, I'm Chris Remo. I'm Jake Rodkin. Hey, Chris. Hey, Jake. Welcome back. Yeah. It's been, what, years? Two years, maybe, yeah. since we did this? I've, I've seen you again in two years. <laughs> <laughs> this is, in uh, in accordance with the return of Twin Peaks, the return of Twin Peaks rewatch. And because it's obviously no longer a rewatch podcast, we are going to be following the show every week as Showtime releases it with the sort of caveat that the first two weeks of their double features. Yeah. The new Twin Peaks is being released initially in kind of a weird way. So the first week, this coming Sunday, will be a double episode. Episodes, so two episodes. episodes one and two are on Showtime, and I believe they're putting the first four episodes available on streaming. Then the week after that, episodes three and four air on television. Yeah. And then after that, it becomes a weekly show. Right. So what we're planning on doing um, is for the first two weeks of the show, we're going to release two episodes a week. So hopefully the day after the premiere airs, our episode one podcast will be up. A few days later, our episode two podcast will be up. You're, of course, referring to the second and third episodes of the original run of Twin Peaks. Oh, shut up. <laughs> please, please don't. Please don't do this. Um, no, yeah. episodes, Episode one of Twin Peaks, The Rebirth or something like return. that. A Return, whatever yeah. it's called. Yeah. And then the following week, on uh, presumably on Monday, we'll release our episode three and midweek we'll release our episode four, and then following that, weekly we'll just on have Mondays. weekly episodes coming yep. out until the until the show's done. So, uh, I'm excited. I mean, it would be nice if we could get all everything out by Monday, but we're we're setting ourselves a more reasonable yes um, schedule here. And also, plus hopefully, then you can like bathe in Twin Peaks. It's also my hope that much like when we did the rewatch podcast of seasons one and two a couple years ago, that having the extra couple of days will allow you guys to send in more reader mail and more sort of thoughts as you can That's percolate on point. the episodes right at the start. Um, there's an email in the purple. Oh my <laughs> God. Oh, it's like all those years have just disappeared I between know. the previous podcast and now. Right off the bat here, I guess it's worth pointing out that our email address is twinpeaks at idlethumbs.net. And if you listened to our rewatch of seasons one and two, uh, reader mail was a huge piece of the show. It was mm-hmm. really, really cool to be able to get people's thoughts about things as they went. Um, and we're hoping to do that again this time. Absolutely. We're also on Twitter at Peaks Rewatch. Um, so you can get us on there as well. Yep. That's true. I am excited. I am really excited that in a matter of days, yeah. we will see new Twin Peaks. I I maybe shouldn't be excited because- I'm legitimately excited as well. I I'm, am too. I'm a person who generally, at this point, this doesn't happen to me that often where I get myself legitimately hyped up for a thing mm-hmm. that has the potential to just be- Yeah, big reboots of sort of cult yeah. favorite TV shows do not have a great track record, but I am- genuinely excited about this oh yeah i think it's really really exciting and cool that david lynch is directing or has directed every episode of this season Mm -hmm. um that is just exciting it's been a really long time since david lynch directed anything yeah at all it's been he's done some shorts and some internet stuff and i think he worked on a documentary but inland empire his last feature was over a decade ago 2006 or something Yeah. yeah So one of the few things that we do have at this point about the show yeah. um, that's sort of like concrete imagery or anything about it is the marketing and sort of the the PR mm-hmm. rollout that Showtime's been doing. Yeah. Um, what do you what do you think about it so far? I mean, it, I have to say this is maybe foolish, but I'm I'm really into the whole way Showtime has been presenting everything. Like they're the the public face that they've been putting on this rollout is I think great and has successfully made me very excited. I know they, they, they've been playing everything very, very coyly. Like no yeah. footage has gone out, uh, which I think is good. Um, well, I mean, there's been clips of footage, right? But, but like, very, no, nothing, nothing, no sub- scenes. nothing substantial yeah, has yeah, shown yeah, up, yeah, yeah. but all of the, all of their 
marketing generally the tone has been very clean i think actually ever since frost and lynch seem to have fully consolidated twin peaks under their own ownership and it like when the complete mystery blu-ray came out from that point on i feel like twin peaks has just been a classy affair as far as how it's presented like um the Secret History of Twin Peaks book was really, really impeccably done from a production design standpoint. Yeah, it's a great addition. And all yeah. of the, um, and yeah, all of the Showtime stuff, it's like, for me at least, it's hit the correct level of like evocative of things that I like about Twin Peaks, mm-hmm. but feeling like it's more about the atmosphere and the mood. And it's all just very crisp in yeah, a way that- it's very that, crisp, very tonal, um, very restrained and short. Yeah. Which all of which I think are, are, the, are good. Yep. Um, even down to, you know, at the end of all the little promos during the little bumper at the end of the YouTube video where it says has the Showtime logo and says subscribe or whatever. Even then, there's just it's just a muted shot of the woods or something that big Twin Peaks low end. It looks like kind of yeah, sound. It's, it's just, something that looks and feels like an establishing shot or a sort yeah. of in between transitional event from yeah. the original series. And Although it feels, I've noticed that a lot of those shots are now subtle pans, which I guess means David Lynch got himself like some quadcopters for establishing <laughs> shots. Like he's flying yeah. some drones yeah. uh, or there's like an owl with a GoPro is probably the canonical reason. Mm-hmm. Hopefully that- the final Showtime trailer actually like blue screens in a shitty stock video of an owl just to like get <laughs> really into the... Just to get really Twin peaks Yeah, just yeah. bathe in the, in the true aesthetic mm-hmm. of Twin Peaks and like yeah. a biohazard logo spiraling out of an right. owl's eye. <laughs> right. And then it says produced by Mark Frost and David Lynch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably it's probably foolhardy to let little marketing snippets get me as excited as they have. But I don't know. It just it is it just feels really good. It feels really good. And we'll see. There's not much point saying too much else about that side of things. Uh, but the fact that they haven't overexposed yes. everything, I think, is the biggest thing that I mean. For all I know, maybe that's because it's bad and they don't have, you know. <laughs> right. But I, but I don't know. I, I'm. It's it's yeah. It is I'm very optimistic. hard to know, like because it yeah. feels, it feels confident, but it could be revealed to be a huge hedge. A hedge, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's very hard to know. The fact that it is this restrained and has this little dialogue and this many atmospheric shots and the 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 sort of tonal breadth on display is very singular. I think yeah. like they're not going because they're not showing any character moments because they're not showing any complicated scene setups it does feel a lot closer to me to fire walk with me than to the main series of twin peaks and also just it's a more modern david lynch aesthetic in the few shots of characters mm-hmm. that you have seen definitely yeah um yep it feels very much a, a lot of the very short shots they've shown feel like they could have been out of lost highway or mulholland drive yes or 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 this is sort of late 90s output it's yep. which is a little just a little different than how twin peaks feels which is a lot brighter yeah. a lot you know it's it's not i guess not surprising if you think about the if you could draw a line from the show to fire walk with me to now basically yeah. like yeah. a trajectory was defined mm-hmm. that it seems to be holding to yeah you know on that note it's interest. it'll be a really interesting i think angle to this show is going to be that it's more twin peaks core television content after the existence of Firewalk with Me, which is yeah, Firewalk with Me yeah. is like that genie is out of the bottle or exactly, whatever. Like you yeah. can't you can't erase Firewalk with Me and go back entirely to a story where like Ben Horn is protecting the pine weasel. Right. On the <laughs> right, yeah, on that, the other hand, I hope that they bring some of that stuff back into yeah. the show, or it will be I think a tough. A tough yeah, 18, 18, hours. 18 episodes of that kind of bleakness of Firewatch with Me would be tough. Firewalk with Me. Firewalk with Me. God. <laughs> That said, I mean, <laughs> if you've listened to our whole run, you know that I love Firewalk with me. Yeah, I, same. I, I am in no way because there are Twin Peaks fans who feel that that movie was sort of a betrayal or something that yeah. really went in the wrong direction. I totally disagree with that, but I also agree with you that you, you for a television show, you do want some of the lightness and wackiness that is less yeah. present in that movie. It, I mean. This has been said by a lot of people, including by us, I think, a couple of years ago when the show was announced but hadn't come out. Um, Fire Walk With Me was not co-written by Mark Frost. That's true. And this show is, and David Lynch and Mark Frost said they were working on story ideas and scripts for about four years before production began, like yeah. on and off sort of between the two of them. It seemed yeah. like 
um, whatever weirdness was going on between them towards the end of Twin Peaks, the main run seems to have healed itself many years I mean, or decades sense. ago. It's been yeah, decades, it's been yeah. decades. They spent a long time working on this together. But what I've read is that um, once production started, the two of them kind of split paths again and Mark Frost showed up on set sometimes like there's publicity photos of him on set sure but the sort of like there's sort of the, the knowledge that people have shared online or sort of the the story that is told about the production of this show uh, from I guess interviews that those guys have been doing is that Mark Frost was not really involved right, in the day to day production yeah. like uh-huh. Mark Mark Frost was not uh, doesn't or doesn't seem like, like a co show doesn't seem like he was a showrunner yeah, with yeah. Lynch the way that those two guys were in the first season of Twin Peaks right um that said, I did in between Twin Peaks rewatch and, and this new Twin Peaks rewatch, I did my homework and I read all of Reflections, the oral history of Twin Peaks. Oh yeah, and it actually closes, um, or it doesn't close, but the final chapter or one of the final chapters is about the season finale of Twin Peaks, which mm-hmm. um, Mark Frost, uh, Robert Engels, and Harley Payton is that yep. man? Wow, uh-huh. it's been a while since we talked about this stuff that those guys co-wrote. And then David Lynch came in and directed it with basically no on the set input from those guys and changed a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And forever people were like, was there bad blood? Blah, 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 blah. There's a great quote from Mark Frost that I that I suspect is also probably going to apply to season three. Um, He says uh, he says about the final episode. I never questioned David's vision at any point in the process because his instincts are extraordinary. We knew it was going to be the last one, possibly for all time. And I think I remember saying, do whatever you want to do here. Use this script as a map, not as a set of directions. And he did. And when you've got a talent as singular as David, you don't question that. That would make no sense whatsoever. Yeah. And like that was at least his emotional point when he did the oral history of Twin Peaks book in like 2013. And my suspicion is that that's the attitude that he took about this show of yeah. like, we're going to write, that makes we're going to write these things together. You're going to, you're the director of this mm-hmm. show at this point. He also, Frost also obviously has his own other sort of weird domain onto which he the has novels. gotten to, yeah, stamp his, Cause, his personal print. Yeah. Basically. Twin Peaks, uh, I guess the secret history of Twin Peaks was the name of that novel. Yep. And that came out October of 2016. And he has another one called like the final dossier or something that's coming out after the season is over. That apparently mm. is like extrapolation after that. I'm which was referred to in the secret history. Okay. Right. Wasn't uh, it a uh, dossier? Or, the secret history is, or is like that just the secret history is a huge dossier. Like it's a, yeah. like, is it is it epistolary? Is that the way? Is that yeah? The, you could it call it epistolary. It's, it's novel, close. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. all. There's no. Um, every single thing in that book is documents and letters and research. Right. There's yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. no sort of prose, prose that exists yeah, yeah. outside mm-hmm. of it to frame it. Um, I will. I will write it now. Cop to not having finished that book, I couldn't quite get through it. But Jake, you read the whole thing. I did read the whole thing. I actually listened to the audiobook and then I leafed through the book because the audiobook. Um, was read by the entire cast. That's so awesome. It is really cool. Or not the entire cast, but any that they could get. Yeah, sure. Um, and that was that was really cool. Some some people brought their brought their all in a way that, that yeah. some didn't. But uh, <laughs> sure. And the book itself is also really well laid out. Like you get to pages that are like yeah, excerpts it's a from really the Twin Peaks object. Gazette, and yeah. it's just like it is the same old letterhead from the props on the show and from yeah. like old fan newsletters and stuff. Um, a thing that is interesting to me about this split, though, about the fact that Mark Frost has gone off and made these books and David Lynch is going and making the TV show, I do wonder how much we're witnessing Twin Peaks getting split in half. Yeah. Because I found I found that the books um, or the book was very much in line with a lot of the stuff that started to get into season two that felt right, like the weird lore it was yeah. the mm-hmm. book is very much like like if, the extended lore yeah, specifically if, if what you're stoked about is like how does the black lodge connect to owl cave to the hit the denizens of yeah. twin peaks and their previous which, life and which, then how does it connect to like the world and what is it right. and how far have the tendrils reached mark that, frost that feels like the stuff in twin peaks that was influential to shows like lost yes you know and mark frost is clearly still really into that stuff yeah. and the book is steeped in that stuff it was as you can probably guess not my favorite right. stuff in that book there's that's, that's what i read that was the wall there, I ran into. there's there's stuff in sort of the deep middle of the book that gets into like recollections from uh major briggs and the log lady and hank and norma the hank and norma stuff is canonically inaccurate it doesn't line up with the show which mark frost has been really coy about hmm. um empty wentz is not 
featured in this book and instead Norma's mom mm-hmm. has a different backstory if I'm not mistaken. Ah, interesting. It's really weird. But the stuff like when he gets into um when he gets into the 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 writing in the voice of and sort of talking about the history and thoughts from the perspective of some of the really core yep. characters in the show, especially sort of the core but fringe ones like that you feel like those guys really did like as characters like the log lady and major briggs like mm-hmm. the characters that have God, some of good the, old major briggs yeah um that stuff in the book like well the fact that those two actors are no longer alive know, it's really sad hurt a little bit but like i actually had strong emotional reactions to those parts of that book because i felt like he captured their voice really well and you could tell like his love of those characters and sort of wanting them to continue to exist and like continue to to tell some of their story yeah came through in a way that like you know government operations in various naval bases across the western co- pacific uh, yeah. coast of the united states just didn't did just not flat, and yeah. like so i mean on that actually we got some we got some uh, tweets from paul verhoven who writes Mark Frost, this is very much in the line of what uh-huh. you just said. Mark Frost's Twin Peaks has always <laughs> been about Owl Cave and aliens, whereas the core of Twin Peaks has been Lynch's artful mindfuckery. So do you think Lynch considers the bits of the book with the Nixonian weirdness in its quasi-Illuminati wankfest canonical? And then he adds, the prison letter and Coop's letter to the sheriff were brilliant. Actually, the whole middle part was rock solid. So it sounds like his take on this book very much mirrors yours. Yeah. And he, the thing he's wondering is, like, what does it mean in the context of that sort of more Lynchian Twin Peaks. I don't know. I mean, my my th- f- first, I think that the ex- the specific way that he breaks down what Frost and Lynch did does a little bit of a disservice to the two of them working together. I, I think so too. But I mean, it's it, that that's the like the really really coarse separation. But obviously, this yeah. show was conceived between the two of them. It's, it's funny. Like, yeah, you know. I, I actually went and listened to all of our episodes over again uh, in yeah. preparation for this season. It seemed like a, a good way for me to get up on what was going on. And then I read Reflections, the Oral History of Twin Peaks, and I read Mark Frost's book. And the a thing that was interesting to me about the things David Lynch says about Twin Peaks, um, I really feel like David Lynch, like he says it and it's a David Lynch thing and so it's hard to parse but he says that he <laughs> loves the town of Twin Peaks yep. and that he loves the characters of Twin Peaks and he loves the world of Twin Peaks and I wonder if David Lynch feels that way about any of the characters or locales or settings of any of his other works or if the fact that Mark Frost worked with him to sort of flesh it out as an actual world built in a sort of world building way is the thing that has actually allowed him to have those feelings about these characters. Like the characters and the setting of Twin Peaks are just the David Lynch element is a huge part of it, obviously, but the fact that they exist with concrete lives that have a plot and they have very normal human wants and desires that he can then dig into, I think is probably actually the thing that allows him to have what seems to be a really deep emotional connection with these characters and with these worlds that he might not for the characters in Lost Highway or Mulholland Drive. Well, he's never otherwise revisited one of his works in this way. I I think, I mean, obviously we can never actually know, but Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really sympathetic to your like implication there. I mean, it's, I love David Lynch and his films. Absolutely. But they just operate in a totally different kind of yep. attitude to characters and world, which than yeah. twin peaks does. It's, I mean, it's and that's not to say that one is better or no, worse. No, absolutely not. But I, no, definitely. I mean, his, his, his cinematic voice is like extremely singular, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm not in any way disparaging it cause it's incredible and unique. Um, but but yeah, there's a sort of almost mundanity to the characters and situations of Twin Peaks that is not present. There's like in a mundane much solidity to them, I think. Yeah, uh-huh. uh, and that and that uh, surely much of that is due to uh, to Mark Frost and or the colla- and or the collaboration yeah, between I, them. I I feel like having seen. I mean, we'll see for sure what the show ends yeah. up being. I suspect. I mean. Just objectively, the show is going to be more of a sustained David Lynch production than we've ever seen out of the Twin Peaks universe. But it's feeling more and more to me like the thing that David Lynch and Mark Frost have sort of both made peace with and come to appreciate is the fact that together the two of them created this world that they both 
actually value and have personal emotional attachment to wanted to carry forward and do something within their careers, even if maybe they don't care about the fact that they aren't literally doing every single detail together. Yeah. I don't know if that's true or not, yeah. but that's yeah. the fact that Mark Frost is basically publishing two phone books worth of novel <laughs> right. and David Lynch is making 18 sustained hours yeah. of television, yeah. which was shot like the biggest movie he's ever made. Mm-hmm. Also, the sh- the um, Mark Frost dis- and, and uh, a VP at Showtime described the script for Twin Peaks season three as a 400 page phone book as well. So oh my like, God. <laughs> um, That's so yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, this, this is so stupid, but I, there's a part of me that is like, I, I, I know, I think Gord, I've learned since we did the, uh, since we did the rewatch podcast, I was not aware of this, but I guess Gordon Cole, uh, the character portrayed by David Lynch, the FBI mm-hmm. sort of ch- bureau chief bureau or whatever chief, he is. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy that character, but I've learned that some people really dislike him. I guess he's a polarizing character. Oh man, to some I love degree. him so I, much. Oh, I do too. God. And um, I'm I was really glad to see claims that he is a significant character in season three because I, yeah, that is a been... character who can only exist in a world that has some degree of sort of levity and lightness about it, right? It's I mean, funny. I don't know he, how he was that scene with him in fire walk with me was one of the most like twin peaksy goofy yeah. scenes uh-huh. in fire walk with me like Definitely. when he showed up oh that actually reminds me another reflections anecdote yeah um because when we were talking earlier about how this is a post fire walk with me show mm-hmm. um a thing that w- that was mentioned in reflections the oral history of twin peaks man also having read that i cannot recommend that more highly to people who are interested in twin peaks stuff especially oh, reflections reflections yeah. especially having if you listened to our podcast we ended up getting so into sort of the differences in production of each episode and following yeah. sort of the arc uh-huh. of the show and different that, directors different and yeah, writers, yeah the book is deep it, into it, that it talks about it talks to so many people on the crew Oh, yeah. So this is um, a quote from James Foley, who directed a late season two episode. He directed episode 24 Uh and um, talking about his work on that. And he said, the one hiccup I can recall was when I was suddenly inexplicably taken with the notion that one of the characters, I can't remember which, should be carrying a blue suitcase. Uh, When I hit the art department with the idea, I was met with some worried glances and whispering. Finally, someone let me know that David did not want the color blue to appear in the series. (laughs) My immediate reaction was to speak to him, um, but he was in Tokyo at an art exhibit. Um, whatever you know, he was. He said I wasn't used to this, but it was clearly David's show. I never did personally meet him, and I never saw Blue pop up in any of the episodes. It's interesting. That's so fascinating. In Fire Walk with Me, the only place is the only place that Blue shows up as a character thing, which is the Blue Rose cases. Which mm. is like, I don't know what that means, yeah. but I think it's interesting that the one time David Lynch pops Blue into the show or into the entire world of Twin Peaks is that one prop that is the symbol for I guess presumably lodge lore blah 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 related like Gordon Cole's personal pet cases seem like yeah. they get that but it makes me wonder now that I heard that quote I'm going to be on the lookout for that showing right, up course, but like yeah. basically red yellow green and brown are functionally the, the palette, only colors yeah. in Twin Peaks other yeah. than occasionally the sky is blue but like well sure yeah yeah, yeah that's really interesting yeah, I don't know. Like yeah. uh, when I read that quote, though, I thought, "Geez, that the only like blue seems like a striking Twin Peaks color to me." But it's because they make it pop out of the color palette of the, of mm-hmm. the entire run for that one scene. Yeah, when talking about Gordon Cole's blue rose cases, huh? Which I'm sure has been observed by infinite people because people have read that book. But sure, sure, um, sure. Yeah, yeah. Also, I like that that guy's like a blue suitcase go good here, and yeah. the art department just went. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Really David's in Japan yeah, and he yeah. asked for a blue suitcase. <laughs> That's yeah. really good. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Well, um, we have a uh, an email from Michael Mariano who, uh, yes. who writes, what do you want out of the new cast members for season three? Do we need a fresh batch of high school students or something entirely different? I, I don't have an opinion or care about this. It it honestly hadn't occurred to me for a long time when they announced that this show was coming back that there obviously would be a ton of new characters. Uh-huh. Well, and then it was revealed that there are, in fact, there are about a million infinite new yeah. characters. That, that's the reason I think this is notable is because one of the few things we know about this show is that everybody is in it. Yeah. There are just there are dozens and dozens of. Uh, I'm just scrolling through the names on the Wikipedia a- entry for this new series. 
and it is crazy. I mean, re- crazy names. Eddie Vedder of Pearl Jam is Joe on here. Biden. <laughs> Amanda <laughs> Joe Biden Seyfried, is not in it um, that I know of. Tim Roth, Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails. God, is the cast of Invitation to Love listed in here somewhere? Oh, God. They don't, none of them are credited. Gen- Jennifer Jason Lee. Yeah, no, I know. They don't list who anyone's playing. Ashley Judd. It just, I mean, it's there. It is, it is outrageous. Um, yeah. Laura Dern yeah. is is in here and has been in some of the promotional materials, which is really interesting. As oh, there was a big variety feature that had Laura right. Dern, David Lynch, and Kyle MacLachlan mm-hmm. on, on the cover, uh, and it was a huge feature, which I didn't read because I've been kind of... Uh, I didn't as, read it either, but I watched some video content from it. Yeah, but just, as the Showtime marketing has been getting closer and closer, the amount that they've been releasing has finally been growing, yeah. and I got to some video f- that I saw, and I went, ah, okay, I got to actually stop. I got to disengage from this stuff and just wait till the show comes out because it's like a week and a half. Monica Bellucci, Jim Belushi, okay. Michael Sarah. Yeah, you got to stop. You have Peaks. to stop. I don't, yeah, he okay. was one of the first people announced, actually. Was he? That's so funny. It's 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 fascinating. Yeah. I don't know how you fit this many characters, but I, I assume many of them will be walk-ons. Oh, one another I- interesting thing that I saw. Um, there's a, a, a film editor named Dwayne Dunham. He, mm-hmm. I think, was the, an editor on... Man, I think he edited on Blue Velvet or on some David Lynch feature pre-Twin Peaks. He was an editor on Return of the Jedi. He cut the Twin Peaks pilot episode mm. and also directed a couple of mid-season or mid-series episodes. He, I don't think, has been working for a while, but David Lynch brought him back as an editor on this show, and I'm excited about that because... That's cool. Um, yeah. It's like, for as much as I hope that this show doesn't live entirely in the past, I hope that people with a good... like I'm glad that that guy's there because I'm really... My my stupid, unwarranted concern, because we've seen and know nothing about this show, mm-hmm. is that David Lynch is going to go, or has gone, and shot a 400-page script. It started off announced as a nine-episode season, turned into an 18-episode season. Yep. And the way that they've discussed the production of this sounds like we're going to shoot it like one huge movie, and we're going to find it in, in yeah, editing. Edit, right. And that's a little bit scary, except that... When you think about it, the pilot of Twin Peaks was kind of produced that way, yeah. where they shot way more because they shot it for, as a two-hour movie and mm-hmm. cut it back down. Fire Walk With Me was and also was, shot well, similarly. And it was released that way in Europe, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and Fire Walk With Me, they shot, as we know, because of the missing pieces, they shot at least twice as much yeah. story as they ended up cutting into the film. Mm-hmm. And I hope, like, hearing that that guy was around, who's a guy who probably David Lynch will trust his instincts, assuming yeah. that his instincts he, are still- He was also the editor on Blue Velvet and Wild at Heart. Yeah. And directed several episodes of Twin Peaks. Yeah, exactly. So, like, um, I don't know. Hearing that there that there are people in the production who are probably both on David Lynch's wavelength, but also who he will trust if they cut a scene together in a way that maybe he would be more indulgent. Were he able to boss that person around? Like, that's sure. kind of. I don't know if that's yeah. the case or not. But I'm like, I'm, I'm. I was happy to see that that guy was around. Yeah. No, it's nice to see bits of continuity like that. I mean, I you're totally right that there's a danger that you can fall too much on, you know, often I think what makes um, uh, sort of revivals like this, especially television revivals, feel so flat is the sort of, there's almost like a heartbreaking dynamic that happens when you sort of get the band back together and put everyone back on screen but they don't as ha- close as you can. No one has a reason to be there necessarily yeah, once you yeah, get down it's to kind it. Of it's sad. It just feels older and kind of like yeah. the just the sort of faded version of what you loved. But I, I, I am somehow not as worried about that from David Lynch in particular because he's just not a director that seemingly, traditionally – that those instincts ha- w- are, would would yep. um, sort of overtake in that way. We'll see. Yep. And so and so that having those elements of continuity feels less risky, I guess, to me. Yes. Than it than it might with with how these it's also, projects are. I mean, the, the the people that are back are also a weird drop in the bucket compared to the amount of everything else that's going on with I this. Know. Yeah. I mean, it really means we just have no idea what to expect. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so actually, I guess. We should talk a little bit about uh, the secret history of Twin Peaks because we got a couple questions about it, and I read it. Right. Um, But before we do that, there's just two quotes, 
two more quotes from Reflections that I wanted to read. One sure. was uh, a quote from Caleb Deschanel, who was a director of a fair number of episodes, and it's just his thoughts yeah. on Twin Peaks in general, which actually ties into um, when we're talking about the editing and the pacing and the potential mm-hmm. indulgence or not of whatever this 18-episode thing is. This is a thing that I that I think is really interesting, and okay, I'll just read it. Um Caleb Deschanel on Twin Peaks says, it was, it was a slow show, but you never felt it dragged. You always sensed that there was something going on under the surface that you had to find. The leisurely pace of it felt like there was a time bomb in a bag in the side of the room. It had this sense that at any moment something terrible could happen or something exciting or wonderful could happen. It just created this wonderful reality. And mm-hmm. I think that is true. And that's also a thing that I don't find true about everything that David Lynch makes, but I definitely find true about all the things that he makes on Twin Peaks. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, like, I mean, f- you you mean with respect to other things David Lynch makes, you mean because they're so high tension all the time, like as opposed to they're either high tension all the time or they are like the 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 high tension to the some in some of his stuff to me gets to the point that it actually like breaks and I separate from it and it ends mm. up just feeling like languid and like a dream and like it, it, then I get snapped back into it, but like. I feel like his... Well, yeah, he does... A lot of his films do definitely operate in kind of a dreamlike reality, which Twin Peaks never quite does. Twin Peaks generally operates in the actual literal world. Yeah. You know, even with that running other thing alongside it. It's true that a lot of his stuff has... I mean, there's always sort of the feeling that the characters are just being slowly crunched out of existence and there's a crazy yeah, intensity like to everything. Or something feels that way to me. But the way that the way that he describes Twin Peaks feels almost like a bridge between those David Lynch things and like the best like feelings you get from like a Hitchcock movie or something yeah, where you're almost right. like your 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 desire to know what happens and why is happening at the same time as the at least in the best David Lynch stuff at the same time as you're also just like being stressed the heck out by it and I hope that that balance can be maintained that's actually the thing that I feel like I feel like that's a really good encapsulation of what Twin Peaks on the whole feels like when it's at its best and I mean Fire Walk With Me dives 100% into that without anything else but yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels more like a David Lynch movie because it is one the other the other piece that I wanted to get into for half a second uh, oh, actually, there's there's one more quote about tw- uh, from Robert Engels. Yeah, and he's um, and he sort of was became one of the main sort of yeah seeming uh, like showrunners basically. Yes, but yeah. Uh, and this okay, so there's there's two that are just kind of if you listen to all of our episodes on season two, I think these are both kind of interesting. Um, one is interesting in a genuinely interesting way, and one of them is about Wyndham Earl. So <laughs> the Robert Engels quote is. Uh, I think once the murder was solved, you couldn't write scenes that were about guilt. I always thought that's what drove the series. I don't know what David, Harley, and Mark thought, but I always thought that's what made the series work. You could always go pick a character from the town, and they all felt guilty about what happened or about something that happened. Mm. uh, That was such a wonderful thing. So that, of course, was gone. Looking back on it, that would be the most unsatisfying part of it. You kind of lost a weapon. And I think that's that's, That's that's an interesting look at um, at that. and, and there are multiple sources of guilt as well, for what it's worth, right? Yeah, it's yeah, not just yeah, Laura, but yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. I think that went away though. Like yeah, people yeah, weren't yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> this is this I very much enjoy. We speculated about this a lot, uh, and the actor who played Wyndham Earl did in fact come up with his disguises, as well as the <laughs> fact that his character was a master of disguise. <laughs> oh, yeah. So he says, "Well, I was told a little bit about Wyndham. He had been an ex FBI agent. His wife had been killed, and Cooper. Uh, you know, a few things about him being on the run, and that he was a master of disguise." which we decided. <laughs> uh, we kind of went from there in pursuit of Dale Cooper. He uh, he would come on with these various disguises. Bob knew I was quite skillful at the time, so he kept throwing them at, at me. I would have access to the scripts, unlike a lot of people, uh, because Bob knew I liked to, to look at it and decide how Wyndham would appear, for example, at the library. I thought he should be English. And then was he with the, when he was at the counter, I said, I'd like to appear as a fat biker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this marvelous woman who did the costumes would come up with anything I wanted. Shakespeare often uses disguise in his plays as an element for villainy and, and for comedy. And in that sense, I felt like, yes, Wyndham, some sort of Shakespearean villain. I think there's a connection there. The actor is Wyndham Earl, apparently. Yeah, the yeah. guy who played Wyndham Earl, he's just based on himself. Because just... we, we kept being like, 
does does this guy just like read the script and then make up a funny disguise, then get the costume guy to make it and yes. walk onto scene? Yes, the answer 100%. is yes. percent. Uh, oh, also this uh, this kind of made me sad. He actually can play that flute and rehearsed a ton and worked with Bad Lamenti for stuff that he should be playing, and uh-huh. then they cut it in the mix and replaced it with a synthesizer. Oh, amazing! <laughs> so he was like, oh, like. And that's another thing that we talked about, about just like, that might have been more effective had he actually been playing the yeah. instrument. And he totally he was. was. <laughs> he totally was. He worked out melody lines with Bad Lamenti, and then they just replaced oh. it with like, on a synthesizer. <laughs> that's incredible. So anyway, that's like a little season two catch up before yeah. we venture fully into season sure, three. I just sure. had, I had to wrap up. Yeah. Did Wyndham Earl's actor make up his own disguises? Yes. 100% yes. Yeah. That's truly incredible. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of things to tie up, this maybe can segue into the into the book. Brett Duville asked us on Twitter, honestly, the only thing I want to know is whether Audrey Horn got out of that bank explosion. All right. Well, uh, before we get into the book, I guess if you're a person who really feels like you want to read the book clean, we're going to talk a little bit about the contents of the secret history of Twin Peaks right now. However, we're not going to do a spoiler music interlude or any of that stuff because I believe... We're a week away from season three of Twin we're Peaks. Le- much less than a week away. Oh, we're less than that. We're yeah. days away yeah. from season three of Twin Peaks coming out. And at that point, the reveals or not of this book are either going to be deemed known because we're existing 26 years after the final season right. or irrelevant because David Lynch isn't, be isn't going yeah. to address them in the show. Yeah, yeah. So um, either, either way, we figure it's moot. It's moot. Yeah. But that said, if you really are in the middle of reading that right now and you don't want me to just yeah. like step on a page ahead of you. Yeah. Come uh, back to this later. We'll see you guys in, in 25 years. In just <laughs> what do we talk about? That kid who uh, is the Tremont kid when he starts directing Twin Peaks season four in 25 years. <laughs> Wait, That's like what? David Lynch's nephew or something, oh, the right? Oh, kid? Yeah. yeah. God. <laughs> that little jerk. He's going to play Gordon Cole in the flashbacks. He's not, I don't think. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so- Welcome to the part where we know the secret history of Twin Peaks. Mm, thank you. Audrey survives the explosion. Shocker, given that hasn't her actress been... Yeah. What was her name? Sher- Sherilyn uh, Fenn. Sherilyn Fenn. She's the only one, canonically, who survives the explosion. Oh, really? Yeah. But I mean, that means all the other actors uh, in that scene, I don't think, are alive. But mm. in the book, yeah. So whatever, Eckerts and whoever the hell else were in that, and Pete died. Right, right, right. right. Um, and... After that happened, apparently Catherine is now a recluse living somewhere away from the world, mm. as I've learned. Yeah. Anyway, so that's 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 known. The end. <laughs> uh, well, that was unexciting. Yeah. Well, I guess you ask a simple question and you get a simple yeah. answer. Yes, she did. Um. I don't know how much other spoilery book stuff I have beyond that question because we talked about a lot of the general stuff about the book sort of yeah. in the context of Mark sure. uh, of Mark Frost and David Lynch working together. Um, well, there's a, we got another question about the book. Yeah, Mike, uh, Mike Mariano writes in with another email. Our number uh-huh. one emailer during the hiatus sent yeah. two emails. says, hi, Chris and Jake. I just finished reading The Secret History of Twin Peaks. I found it to be an extremely limited interpretation of Twin Peaks, made all the more disappointing coming from one of its creators. On the series, Mark Frost was terrific at juggling a large cast of characters and setting up soap opera machinations, especially during the season one finale. The Secret History of Twin Peaks doesn't play to these strengths. Events are related one perspective at a time, so narratively there's no opportunity for the soap opera interplay, revelations, or one-upsmanship. And when Frost addresses the mysteries of Twin Peaks, they come across as reductive. Whatever supernatural force that torments Meriwether Lewis is something external, not a part of himself. This interpretation would also put uh, put up a separation between Bob and Leland, which I don't think makes the character more interesting. I agree. Um, that I agree with me, Jake Rodkin. In the book, Frost highlights the difference between a secret, something that is hidden that can be discovered, and a mystery, something unknown that usually remains that way which I found to be a really arbitrary distinction, but whatever his characters. I think that's a fair dis- distinction. I mean, mysteries. Yeah. I, no, I, mean, I mean, it's, I, it's good for him to say there are two sort of types yeah, of unknown right, things. I don't yeah. like his labels. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, a mystery is something that is solved. Usually. I guess a secret is something that is intentionally kept that way. Whereas a mystery typically is not. Yes. 
Um, that's the I think that the the definitions that Mike uses are closer to what Mark Frost uses. I see. Uh, his characters favor the mystery over the secret, but that doesn't t- come across as well as it should. I guess that's why it's the secret history of Twin Peaks. <laughs> um, we actually got a third email from Mike Mariano. Oh, okay. Which I thought was the one you were going to read. Oh. It's a lot, it's, the one you read was probably more worth reading, but this one's two sentences, so I'll read it now. (laughs) He finally, in his third email, asks us, what do you think of Doug Milford being used as the central character of the book? Are there any other characters you think would provide a good perspective of the secret history of the town, Mike? Um, I thought that all the Doug Milford stuff was my least favorite stuff in the book. Mm. Mark Frost actually said in, I think, some Q&As that he did when he did the book tour that he chose Doug Milford as the vehicle for his book because Doug Milford was such an inconsequential character that he could safely pin a bunch of stuff Remind on him. who that even is. Doug Milford is one of the old brothers, I believe, who mar- oh, who gets in a fight. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, Doug okay, Milford, of course. just like... Dougie, wasn't he? D- yeah. yeah. Um, and Mark Frost chose him to be like in all these crazy... U.S. military secret operations, and he ends up sort of, I think, tech. I think was originally Major Briggs's boss in the like Project Blue Book base up in the mountains of Twin Peaks, yeah, and all of this stuff. And uh, I don't know. I if you've listened to this podcast before, I guess you'll <laughs> be unsurprised to hear that I don't care. <laughs> like. It's fine. Putting more yeah. of that stuff on a character who was already kind of an inconsequential yeah. addition to Twin Peaks f- allows me personally to categorize it as a lot of inconsequential stuff. That said, I know there are a lot of people for whom this book was an incredibly fun read. And like yeah. I, the like a lot of this stuff, w- the places when this all felt the most resonant to me was when any of the mysterious events and the strange sort of happenings and experiences that these characters had crossed over into their personal lives right. and the stuff that was just chronicling. I mean, as on the show, right? I yes, mean, as, uh, as on the show. Like, the the person that I actually found more interesting in this book was the character of the archivist who is the person who compiled the, who compiled the dossier. Like, the way, the way that this book is structured is that there is a huge dossier of – books and letters and old Twin Peaks ephemera that were collected by someone anonymously refer- who refers to themselves as the archivist and then were, were given an FBI investigator's notes as she peruses all of these files. So mm-hmm. it's sort of like three layers of contents where you have the archivist's notes the or- on top of the original documents and then you have the FBI agent's notes on top of those. Like it's, it's a cool conceit and makes things multi-layered but as Mike said in his email, I don't feel like it's anywhere near as effective as yeah. the way that Mark Frost actually layers the different characters in the right. show. Right. Um, this is another spoiler for the book, but the archivist is revealed to be Major Briggs. Mm. And mm. I really thought that was good. And it actually like, the writing at the very beginning of the book, like there's an archivist's foreword. And yeah, when right. I read that, I knew that it was Major Briggs because just the tone of it felt so much yeah, like that's really cool. the speeches that he gives to Bobby or to Cooper about sort of his life outlook mm-hmm. and the way that he thinks about himself in the town. And I felt like the opening and closing being the archivist and some of his notes in between, um, I thought that Mark Frost's choice of using Major Briggs as sort of the person who's decided he's going to preserve Twin Peaks' history was mm-hmm. really smart and good. I yeah, wish I, that this history was not the story of Doug Milford going right. to Project Blue Book. Like the, right. the parts where Briggs talks about Doug Milford and his relationship with him working was like the time that it became the closest to me accepting it because again, like it touched yeah. a personal life of mm-hmm. a character who has a realized voice and who I sort of also can bring my knowledge from the show, but like, I didn't, I just, I, people are annoyed whenever we get into this mode, but I just couldn't care yeah. about the other Doug Milford yeah. stuff. Like, no, I mean, that's fair enough. It just, yeah. I'm, I always, and it's not that I don't like the presence of this stuff in Twin Peaks. I just like it so much more when it is influencing and sort of falling through the weird sort of psycho emotional tumbler of these characters lives and coming out the other side as opposed to it being ex- as mechanical. opposed to me expecting to find yeah. it interesting in and of itself right. yeah yeah. Yep. yeah that's not really fair I'm, I'm obviously sympathetic to that and yeah. it'll be like at this point um in the tradition of some of the other ancillary promises we made early in twin peaks rewatch i would be interested in getting into this book and the other book when they're both out and we've gotten through the show i yep. think that like if we're going to get 18 hours of david lynch 
Maybe at the end we can do a couple hours of Mark Frost sure. and just look at what the yeah, heck yeah, yeah. his encapsulated version of Twin Peaks is because they're both treating this like it's the final outing for Twin Peaks. Like none of they're right. not right, right, alluding right. to the fact that there's going to be another season after right. this. Like mm-hmm. I think like Lynch gets 18 hours of Twin Peaks out of his system. Mark Frost gets a couple it, books, including the yeah. script, has written three phone books worth of That's Twin true. Peaks <laughs> story. Yeah. Uh, so I think that they're yeah. like we can finally put it to bed the way that we want, and I think. That would be an interesting thing to look at when everything is said and done. Yeah. Well, I mean, on that, maybe we can wrap up this podcast. Um, Obviously, as you've heard, we're both really excited about the series. Um, I mean, I'm really looking forward to it. We're, uh, as always, looking forward to hearing your thoughts as well. So as Jake said earlier, you can contact us at twinpeaks at idlethumbs.net. Our website is TwinPeaksRewatch.com. And uh, if you do like this show, please uh, tell a friend. We got some great word of mouth when we were doing our original rewatch run. And it's really exciting to be able to do this alongside new Twin Peaks. Because when we started that rewatch, that was definitely not. No, we started it because they announced that they were doing the show. Really? I thought it happened after we started. (sighs) I thought, I can't even remember now. I can't remember either. And I just listened to that episode like four weeks ago. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. In any case, I I am, regardless of of when we started getting excited about that, now that it's actually days away, I am very excited about it. Yes, same. Um, So if you do like our Twin Peaks discussions, please pass it on. It means a lot to us. And I guess with that, we will be back uh for the first episode of the new twin peaks like we said for the first two weeks it'll be on a on a twice a week schedule and then after that we'll just keep following the the show the first episode is called part one i'm both relieved and incensed that they have introduced yet another numbering scheme (laughs) into twin peaks like this is yeah episode 30 or 31 man aka one it's a disaster Yeah. yeah uh it's fine yeah it's totally fine all right uh it's totally fine (laughs) on that we will be back very soon yep see you guys bye instead of going on a truck and going to the theater it goes on a truck to the tv God, I miss doing that voice.